Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum welcomes you to our 11th webinar. Many of you have seen our programs before, but some of you are new viewers, so I want to tell you a little bit about us. Our museum is located on Ford Island in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and is known as the first aviation battlefield of World War II. Our mission is to share stories, impact, and response to the attack on Pearl Harbor that happened on December 7, 1941, and to the battles that followed in the Pacific region. Today, you're going to hear stories surrounding an aircraft lost during an air battle that occurred in the Solomon Islands, which is east of Papua New Guinea and northeast of Australia. We started hosting webinars in April when the global pandemic came to Hawaii, and we shifted to staying at home and sheltering in place. Now we are again at under stay at home orders, but we are glad to be able to still connect with you um, and connect with a larger audience through these webinar programs. We have several educators here from the museum who help us behind the scenes and help to make our programs possible. Ford and Ford, Ashley and Eric, they help monitor the chat and Q&A and answer any questions you might have as we go along. Please also add any questions that you might want for our guest speaker and the, in the Q&A, um, and we'll make sure we answer those live at the end of the program. Ashley also has prepared some education resources about the Swamp Ghost, and we'll have those available on our website, and I'll email those to you after the program. So please take a look at those. So during our program, again, you can add comments to the chat and questions to the Q&A. So in our webinars, we've had attendees from all over the world and from different islands here in Hawaii. We'd love to know where you are watching from, so please consider adding your home state or country to our chat. As always, please remember to be thoughtful and kind with your comments on the chat. Our mission here at the museum is to educate and inspire future generations about aviation through history. And today's topic is about an airplane that became active in Hawaii in the early 1940s and eventually found its home back here in Hawaii at the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum in Hangar 79. So today is a special day. It is September 11th, 2020. 19 years after the attack on the Twin Towers, the World Trade Center in New York City. Many people vowed to never forget what happened on that day and to remember and honor those who perished. Those first responders who tried to help in any way that they could, and those who have fought valiantly against terrorism and Operation Enduring Freedom. So we chose the topic of the Swamp Ghost for today's webinar because it involves a variety of stories that help us to understand a piece of history that rests in our museum and because it involves the story of one family whose loss of a beloved uncle in World War II led to the discovery of multiple downed aircraft from World War II in the swamps of Papua New Guinea. Because of these discoveries, other families were able to reconcile their own loss of their loved one who had been missing in action until this time. It's quite an honor for us here at the museum to share these stories on a day of remembrance. So I wanna welcome Alfred Hagen, who's here to tell the story of his family who ultimately, and this, which ultimately led to his discovery of the Swamp Road. So Alfred, welcome to our webinar. We're so glad that you're here to share the stories of your family and also the story of your recovery and salvage of Swamp Ghost. Thank you. So next I'm gonna show you a trailer of the, the Swamp Ghost that is shown on the History Channel. here, they died here. I returned here to get the airplane that was flown in by my countrymen. It became my property. It became my property. This particular aircraft may not be worth anything to some people. To me, this B-17 is priceless. Well, thank you, Monica. And thank you, Monica. And I want to thank the entire staff of the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum for their wonderful stewardship of the B-17 Swamp Ghost. Particular thanks to the Alyssa Lines, to Monica, to Eric Cradle, to the lovely Ashley Duarte, and to Ford Esabugawa, who has an extraordinarily unusual name. 
And before I get into my thing, I just want to mention briefly, I asked Ford about his name the other day, and it turns out that he's a fourth generation Japanese American. And I said, well, how did you get a name like Ford? And he admitted that he was one month premature and burst into life in the front of a Ford Crown Victoria. So wonderful story. And I, I want to encourage everyone to go to the Pearl Harbor Museum. It's hallowed ground, it's sacred ground. And where else can you go to see wonderful airplanes, historic military airplanes on an actual battlefield and meet beautiful woman, charming woman, and a fourth generation Japanese American named Ford. So without further ado, we're going to go into my slide presentation, which concerns the B-17 Swamp Ghost. So if you could advance that, Monica. Swamp Ghost was made in Seattle in the last week of November, 1941, uh, transferred to Hamilton Field and arrived there on the very last day of peace, December 6th, 1941. Afterwards flew to Pearl Harbor and, in, and then went to Australia and engaged in a mission, a Carmichael's raid and remained in a swamp for many years until I salvaged it in 2006. So advance to the next slide, Monica. And one more time. So Pearl Harbor to me is the ultimate destination for the B-17 Swamp Ghost for many reasons, not the least of which is my own family history and my family's connection with Hawaii and also the connection uh, to Hawaii with the Swamp Ghost own service history. Uh, that fellow in, in the red circle is my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, William Doyle, who served in Hawaii in 1928, 1929. Uh, next slide, please. And my uncle Victor Hagen was a Pearl Harbor survivor. Uh, he was originally stationed on the USS Cassin. He was a gun captain on number two gun. Shortly before the attack, he was transferred to the USS Cummins. The Cassin uh, was in dry dock next to the Pennsylvania and was bombed heavily and sank. There's an iconic picture of the Cassin where it's leaning against the downs. And I think we're gonna see that next if you advance one. So that's the Cassin which is leaning against the downs, the Pennsylvania in the background. Now, having transferred off the cast and shortly before the attack, uh, Victor Hagen was able to fight back, he joined the fight immediately and began operating the number two gun. He was the gun captain. Advance, please. And after the attack started, the uh, Cummings was bracketed by bombs both fore and aft. They barely escaped unscathed. They did get uh, quite a bit of shrapnel on their decks, but they were one of the first to sortie out of Pearl Harbor. In fact, they took the battle immediately to the enemy and are credited with a probable sinking of a submarine known as I-70. Please advance again. I have another great uncle, Fred Ben who was born and raised in Galton, Pennsylvania. Uh, he was my maternal grandmother's youngest brother. And at 17 years of age, inspired by the attack on Pearl Harbor, he begged his father to allow him to sign up in the Marines and he volunteered. He went overseas, uh, never saw his family again. Fred was uh, injured at Tarawa, next slide. Fred was injured at Tarawa Atoll, which was the first amphibious assault uh, conducted by the Marines in World War II. He was one of the drivers of uh, the Amtraks that went back and forth, so he was, uh, it was almost impossible for him to come out of that unscathed. Uh, but he was sent back to Pearl to convalesce, and on May 21st, 1944, he was sitting on the deck of an LST that exploded, and there was a whole line of LSTs in Westlock, and they were being loaded to go to Saipan. And uh, Something went wrong, we're not ex exactly sure what. There was some maintenance work going on, but munitions may have been set off by a spark, but the six ships were sunk and several hundred people were killed, several hundred in injured. It was known as the Second World Har Pearl Harbor, but it was classified at that time. And it was not, you know, news of that disaster did not get out to the world until after the war. Uh, Fred Ben's remains have never been found, so Pearl Harbor is literally his cemetery. Next slide, please. Now, if I want to trace back my own work 
in historic aviation and that led up to the Swamp Ghost, it goes back to my great uncle, Bill Ben. He attended high school in Caldersport, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> that is his high school graduation picture. He then attended Temple University and joined the Army Air Corps in 1932. Spent two years in the Army Air Corps, then joined the Pennsylvania National Guard. In 1938, he uh, got the job as a flying archaeologist, went to Persia with a famous archaeologist named Eric Schmidt to unearth the ruins of Persepolis. That, that was the ancient palace of Darius that was burned by Alexander the Great in 330 BC. So he flew there until the gathering storm clouds of war forced him to return to America. Uh, he went back on active duty and became an aide to General George Kenney. And after MacArthur came out of the Philippines, uh, Kenney uh, was assigned to take over the Air Force in the Southwest Pacific, and he took Bill as his aide. Next slide, please. So he wanted an active command, so he begged Kenny to let him command his own squadron. He was given the 63rd Squadron, and when he arrived in the Pacific, um, they weren't hitting anything because most of what they were attempting to hit were ships. And the, the, the whole concept of a B-17 was based on bombing from the stratosphere, being higher than fighters could fly and flying faster than pursuit planes. And that was a brilliant concept. The only problem was that when you, you know, uh, drop bombs on ships, they could swerve one way or the other and they weren't hitting anything. So Bill decided to use the platform that was available to him at the time, which was a B-17, he trained his crew uh, to perform uh, skip bombing against ships. They had skip bombed in Europe against dams, but he perfected the tactic in the ocean against ships. And they, you know, changed from high altitude to a low altitude attack. Uh, Bill was lost on January 18, 1943, leaving behind a widow and a young daughter. Interestingly, shortly before his death, he, MacArthur personally selected him and awarded him the Distinguished Service Cross, which is the highest award that can be awarded short of the Congressional Medal of Honor. Next slide, please. My work in New Guinea, I went to find Bill, but it grew by leaps and bounds, and I wound up finding a total of five missing American aircraft that contained the remains of American airmen and returned a number of them for burial in the United States. I also salvaged a couple airplanes. This is a P-47 that I worked with Rob Greinert to salvage in 2004. And then later, of course, the Swamp Ghost. So it was a magnificent experience, uh, very meaningful. It was something I didn't anticipate in bringing bodies home to, to other families and resolving uh, the same discomforts and disquiet and that they had experienced that was similar to that known in my own family. Next slide, please. And all those stories of those missing airmen and missing planes, they're, they're wonderful tales, and I wish I could tell them to you, but we, we simply don't have the time. My assignment today is to relate to you the brief lifespan, times, and historical context of the B-17 bomber Swamp Ghost. It is natural to look back at historic facts and see them as inevitable and linear, but if I can encourage you to change your perspective and review these events in real time, we can share a riveting tale of mankind and extremists facing a war whose issue was still an extreme doubt. An awakening American giant, still short of material of every sort, condemned my necessity to abandon the bloody bastards of Bataan to their sad fate, initially sent pilots and ground crew across the vastness of the Pacific without adequate supplies, with too few planes, and without, without spare parts or mechanics. It was truly a desperate time, and we are here today to remember that handful of ragged warriors who were among the very first Americans to take the war to the enemy. Next slide. And I wanna give special thanks to my very good friend and a accomplished historian named Bruce Gamble who wrote this magnificent book, The Kangaroo Squadron, which is, tells the story of the Swamp Ghost and the squadron it flew in. And so, several of the slides that I'm gonna show you today were comes cur courtesy of Bruce and uh, much of the research backing up my presentation is supplied by Bruce, so a very special thanks to Bruce. And B-17-41-2446 was made at the Boeing plant in Seattle at the end of November 1941. And as I mentioned earlier, it was accepted by the United States Army Air Corps on December 6, 1941, and she was assigned to the 88th Reconnaissance Squadron. 
That squadron was scheduled to depart from Hamilton Field, California on the evening of December 6th with an anticipated arrival at Hickam Field in Pearl Harbor around 0800 on Sunday, December 7th, 1941. Now the, the plane that eventually became known as the Swamp Ghost, that was a name given to it in the years after it crashed in the swamp. It was not known as the Swamp Ghost during the war. But the, the plane that we refer to today as the Swamp Ghost was unable to make that departure and was originally scheduled to follow her squadron mates to Pearl the next day, December 7th. The destination of that squadron was actually uh, Clark Field in the Philippines, which was codenamed Plum. They were, Hap Arnold, the commander of the Army Air Corps, was trying to build up an impressive force in the Pacific to counter Japanese aggression and hopefully deter them from actually attacking the Philippines. So on the night of, or the evening of December 6, 1941, the last night of peace in the United States, 16 B-17 bombers were ready for takeoff. Three of them experienced mechanical issues and aborted. Starting around 9 p.m. California time, or 6 p.m. Hawaii time, the 13 remaining fortresses began to war off down the long runway into the gathering gloom of a Pacific night. They took off at 10 minute intervals and each crew was independently responsible to navigate to Pearl Harbor. One of those B-17s soon experienced engine trouble and turned back, leaving 12 flying fortresses in a widely scattered formation headed through the night to Hickman Field. They flew at night because there were very few navigational aids at the time. In the modern era, we've got VOR stations, now you've got GPS aids, there was none of that. This was simply dead reckoning, seat of the pants flying, and at night they were able to use celestial navigation. Now, to fly by the stars, you have to be able to see them. Obviously, you cannot see the stars at night, which is the exact reason why these planes flew 2,400 miles through darkness, intending to arrive at dawn in Hawaii. So, Hawaii was expecting this squad. They knew they were coming. Now, normally, the radio stations in Honolulu at that time ceased broadcasting late in the evening, but the Army Air Corps paid them to broadcast all night at such times as bombers were in transit because the radio stations had the strongest signal. And a local jazz station therefore broadcasts throughout the night of December 6, 1941 and into the morning of Sunday, December 7. Earlier that evening, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt hosted a dinner in Washington. Knowing that war was imminent, but not knowing where it was breaking out, FDR had just sent a last ditch plea directly to the Japanese emperor asking for an accommodation that might prevent hostilities from breaking out. During the dinner, he lightheartedly announced to his guest that, quote, this son of man has just sent his final message to the son of God, end quote. The leader of the aerial assault on the Japanese side was Matsuo Fuchida, a bright and attractive 39-year-old officer possessed of singular leadership abilities. At 0530, Fuchida ascended to the bridge of the Akaji. The seas were rough and a strong wind was blowing. Fuchida saluted Admiral Nagumo and announced that the strike force was ready to depart. Fuchida boarded a Type 97 carrier attack bomber known as a Cape to the Americans. The Cape held three men, the pilot in front, a radio operator gunner in the rear, and a navigator observer in the center section. Fuchida took the center section to both lead and observe the attack. Pearl Harbor would be attacked in two waves. The first wave consisted of 184 aircraft carrying torpedo bombers, level bombers, dive bombers, and zero fighters. By 0630, the first wave was airborne and headed to Oahu as the sky over the Pacific lightened from purple to cobalt hues as the sun rose in the east. Fuchida considered the rising sun an omen, a reflection of the Japanese flag that you can see in this picture. Japan's sun was rising. At 748, Fuchida saw Pearl Harbor spread out peacefully in the distance. He instructed his radio man to signal the attack to the other 102 aircraft in the first flight. At 0753, Fuchida followed up with a radio message back to the Akaji, Tora, 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 meaning that the attack was unleashed and that force, the force had achieved complete surprise. While the Japanese attack force flew towards their target at Pearl Harbor, the scattered B-17s from Hamilton Field were desperately searching for Oahu. They were mostly young men, 
Captain Lewis at 36 years of age and Frank Bostrom at 34 years of age were the oldest members of the group. The commander of the 88th Squadron was Dick Carmichael at 28 years of age. The great fear of these young men was that they would miss the island of Oahu altogether, run out of fuel and ditch in the ocean. Some of them were off course, but all eventually located Oahu and began to converge within a surprisingly tight window close to 0800. One of those B-17s flown by Lieutenant Barthelmus had flown off course to the north and was lower on fuel than anticipated. As they searched desperately for land, the men were told to prepare for the possibility of ditching the bomber at sea. To their relief, they sighted Oahu moments later to their south. Turning towards the island, Barthelmus reduced speed to conserve fuel. To the crew's absolute consternation, they were soon overtaken by an enormous formation of aircraft. It was the Japanese attack wave. The Japanese maintained discipline. No one hit their triggers. They engaged in no hostile action because they had not been released yet to begin the attack. The confused B-17 crew had no idea what they were watching, and they suspected that the Navy was doing some sort of bizarre exercise using strange markings on their aircraft. In what must have seemed an expression of dark humor to the passing Japanese pilots, the B-17 crewmen waved at them sociably as they flew by. Even had the Americans recognized the passing force, they had no means to react. They carried no ammunition, they had no bombs, and their machine guns were stored aft and wrapped in cosmoline. Staff Sergeant Lee Embry carried a personal camera, and he took the picture that we're looking at on the screen along with some subsequent pictures with that camera. And this picture is the first picture of hostile aircraft taken by an American in the Second World War, moments before the attack, or minutes before the attack began. Next slide. The Japanese attack force pulled away from Barthelmas and disappeared in the distance. By the time the B-17 arrived at Hickam, the attack was well underway. As they approached Hickam, they spotted another B-17 on final approach ahead. Fire and smoke rose from the harbor and the airfield. The exhausted airmen still could not fathom the hellish reality that greeted them. They still were arguing about what kind of exercise this could possibly be. And until they got close enough to see the fires and the burning ships and the burning airplanes, they finally heard station KGMB announcing that the island was under an actual attack, which eliminated any remaining doubts. Swede Swenson was on one of the planes that departed Hamilton the night before, and he arrived before Barthelmas, and they passed his burning plane alongside the runway as they landed. As they ex exited their B-17, Lee Embry captured this iconic picture of Swenson's B-17 broken in half and still burning. All the inbound B-17s endured similar adventures. A few landed at Hickam. Some flew to other fields located across the island. The most adventurous landing was made by Frank Bostrom. He was one of the last to depart Hamilton Field and was consequently one of the last to arrive at Hickam. By the time he got to Hickam, all hell had broken loose and any ships afloat were shooting at anything flying in the air above. Bostrom decided against landing at Hickam and he flew north towards Haleawa, hoping to land at an auxiliary, auxiliary field. Several zeros attacked him and in the resulting chaos, Bostrom missed the field at Hali Iwa. Realizing that his engines might cut out from fuel exhaustion at any moment, Bostrom made an incredible landing on a long par five fairway at the Kahuku Golf Club. Miraculously, only two of the B-17s that flew from Hamilton were wrecked. Bostrom was able to eventually take off from the fairway and fly back to Hickam. Several crewmen were injured, but only one B-17 crewman was killed, flight surgeon William Schick. Injured in two places and in shock, he initially waved off medical treatment in favor of men around him that bore more gruesome injuries. He died shortly after arriving at a hospital. As Bruce Gamble reports in his wonderful book, The Kangaroo Squadron, Dr. Schick died not knowing that his wife was one month pregnant. She gave birth to his son in August 1942, on his father's birthday. 27 minutes after the first bomb dropped at Pearl Harbor, 1.47 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the operator at the White House fielded a call from Secretary of the Navy, Knox, and transferred him to FDR, who was sitting in the study. 
inform the president that the Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor. FDR reflexively shouted no as the horrifying implications set in. His initial reaction was followed by an immediate state of determined and focused calm that was noted by several people who visited him in the hours that followed. Back in California, plans to fly more B-17s to Hawaii were put on hold. Panic-stricken Californians expected an invasion at any moment. Lieutenant Fred Eaton was a 24-year-old pilot from Scarsdale, New York, who dropped out of Dartmouth to obtain his pilot wings. Eaton had expected to ship out for Clark Field, but flew patrol missions along the California coast for more than a week. He finally departed for Hawaii, flying B-17E 412446 on December 17th, arriving 11 days after the attack that had united America as never before. Sadly, there were still trapped sailors alive in the holes of the capsized battleships when Fred Eaton arrived in Hawaii on December 18th. Regular tapping noises could be heard from deep within the holes. Those lost souls could not be saved, but were not yet dead. Fred Eaton and his crew immediately joined the other B-17 crews of the 88 Squadron, flying 12-hour reconnaissance missions every other day. Whatever Fred's impressions were of the carnage that greeted him at Pearl, he preferred to write his family of his impressions of life in Hawaii. He spent his days off at the beach swimming and surfboarding at the Outrigger Club. He concluded one letter to his folks by exclaiming, what a life, but it was a life subject to wrenching change and change soon came to Fred Eaton and the other men of the 88 Squadron. Next slide. On February 1st, Bull Halsey made a carrier attack on the Marshals. It was more of a demonstration than a meaningful attack, but it demonstrated to Americans and to the world that U.S. forces were preparing to retake the defense, the offensive. Meanwhile, the Japanese had taken the town of Rabaul. Next slide, please. A town on the northern tip of New Britain Island. Rabaul boosts one of the world's great natural harbors in a volcanic caldera ringed by active volcanoes. Realizing the strategic importance of this deep water harbor, Japan immediately repaired and enlarged the airfield runways, installed a vast ring of anti-aircraft gun emplacements and fortified the town. Rabaul accordingly became a high priority target for the vengeful Americans. In early February, Vice Admiral Wilson Brown left Pearl with a carrier Lexington, forever known as the Lady Lex, and her accompanying ships that were referred to as Task Force 11. Brown was ordered to proceed to Fiji, as you can see on this map. During the crossing, Brown and his staff concocted a plan to mount a surprise attack on Rabaul, the new Japanese fortress in the Pacific. This was an incredibly risking move at this early juncture, but Admiral King approved the plan. On February 11th, Major Richard Carmichael was ordered to lead his squadron of 12 B-17s out of Hawaii and island hopped to Fiji via Christmas and Canton Islands, arriving at Nandi Field, Fiji on February 13th. The squadron flew recon missions in support of Task Force 11 for five days while awaiting to ascertain the loyalties of the Vichy French in New Caledonia. Next slide. On Valentine's Day, February 14th, Chutai 1 and Chutai 2 of the 4th Kukutai, containing nine Betty bombers each, arrived at Rabaul. A third Chutai was en route from truck. Task Force 11 reached Fiji to rendezvous with a number of Anzac ships. Uh, that's Australian New, New Zealand Army Corps, and <clears throat> they were combining all their, their resources. But realizing that he lacked sufficient fuel to support the Anzac element, Brown decided to proceed alone with Task Force 11. Fortress Rabaul lay 1,700 miles ahead. On February 18th and 19th, Carmichael's B-17 trans transited through New Caledonia. The last leg of their trip to Australia was blocked by a tropical cyclone, but the squadron arrived on Garbutt Field near Townsville, Australia on February 19th. Brown's plans for Carmichael's B-17s to attack Rabaul in tandem with Task Force 11 at dawn on February 21st. To accomplish this, Carmichael would need to depart Australia by midnight on the 20th. The mission was forecast to be 18 hours long and amounted to a 2,300-mile round trip. On February 11th, or 19th, excuse me, uh, Australia's Pearl Harbor happened. The Japanese attacked, and again, the attack was led by the same Mitsuo Fuchida off Akaji. 
they, they attacked Darwin and caught them by surprise, and it has been forever afterwards referred to as Australia's Pearl Harbor. Fearful that their precious B-17s might be destroyed on the ground by a similar surprise attack, Carmichael was told to scrub the mission and disperse the Cloncurry, 450 miles in the outback. The squadron took over the town's two hotels and one bar, beginning a reign of riotous American Americans whose generous pay, at least by Australian standards, and love of fun would eventually inspire chagrined and slightly envious Aussie troops to refer to the American airmen as, quote, overpaid, oversexed, and over here, unquote. February 20th, the battle for the Lady Lex. Admiral Goto and Rabal heard reports of an enemy carrier, and he dispatched three enormous Kawanichi K6, K, H6K Mavis flying boats from Rabal. Each of those flying boats held a 10-man crew. At 10.30 hours, Lieutenant Naboru Sakai sighted the Lady Lex and radioed her position. Commander Jimmy Thatch took off from the Lexington with a squadron of Wildcats uh, and led his combat air patrol in hot pursuit. At 11.12 hours, Commander Thatch shot down Sakai after chasing him in and out of clouds. All 12 men aboard the flying boat perished. A second Mavis also appeared and reported the position of the Lexington and was also shot down. The third Mavis that was dispatched uh, was not shot down by the Americans, but never made it back to Rabaul and her fate was unknown. At 1310 hours, Admiral Goto and Merbal ordered the first and second Chutai to attack Task Force 11. Now there are nine planes in each Chutai and one of them had to scrub due to mechanical malfunction. So actually 17 Betty bombers took off. Storms caused the two Chutai to separate but they maintained formation in their individual uh, elements. At 1330 hours, uh, Lovelace Lead, led a new Wildcat squadron to altitude to take over the position of combat air patrol. Thatch landed his squadron and began to refuel. At 1600 hours, Gaylor took off to assume combat air patrol. Lovelace's squadron was low on fuel at that point and were preparing to land, but radar picked up the incoming first Chuktai and Lovelace was waved off. Captain Sherman wanted Thatch's fully fueled wildcats off the deck immediately. So they had to be moved in position. And just so you understand, there's a delicate, intricate ballet that happens on an aircraft carrier. You, know, you don't have enough room for all the, the aircraft on deck. So they're going up and down the elevators. And when they are on deck, uh, you, you, you either need to land an element or take off. And you can't do both at the same time, obviously. So they, he wanted uh, thatch to take off and get to altitude so that there was top cover, even if that meant that the the uh, the, pre the previous combat air patrol might run out of gas. So, and sitting on the deck, uh, if the planes were hit, they became like bombs full of, of aviation fuel. So Thatch took off and Lovelace joined him in attacking uh, the incoming shoot die of Betty's. At 1630 hours, uh, Gaylor attacked and shot three Bettys down. The six remaining Bettys came within range of anti-aircraft guns just as Lex launched the last of Thatch's squadron. The lead pilot Nakagawa was heavily damaged and dropped out of formation. Another Betty was shot down. Four Bettys then began a bomb run. The Lexington, after launch, while they were launching the planes, they could not take evasive action. Once Thatch got airborne, the Lexington began evasive maneuvers and all bombs narrowly missed the carrier. Thatch and his squadron and Gaylor and his squadron, which remember was almost out of fuel, all pursued the bombers. The fox hunt was on. Meanwhile, Nakagawa, who they thought was shot down, recovered unseen and began a stealthy low altitude attack against the Lexington. Flying through intense anti-aircraft flak in a suicide attempt, he almost made it and was shot down 50 feet from the Lexington. While this was going on, Lieutenant Butch O'Hare was flying top cover with a wingman named Dufilho. And Butch O'Hare at this point was frustrated because he was missing out on all the action. 
and he watched as Thatch went off to, to shoot the planes. And then at 1649 hours, Lovelace's squadron uh, managed to land on the Lexington. They all made it back on board. So the Lexington had to turn into the wind to receive those fighters. And if they had not turned into the wind, uh, then the fighters would have been lost because they were on fumes. At that exact moment, the uh, second Chutai arrived and the existing combat air control under Thatch was nowhere to be seen. They were off chasing the disappearing elements of the first Chutai. So the only Wildcats remaining were Butch O'Hare and DeFilho. De and they soon realized that O'Hare's wingman, his guns were jammed. That was not an uncommon problem. His guns were jammed, he could not fire. All he could do was to try to distract attention away from Butch O'Hare. So at this moment, there is a um, squadron of Betty bombers attacking the Lexington, and there's only one Wildcat in the air to defend them. So the flight, the Lexington flight director calls out the Thatch and Gaylor squadron to all buster back in defense of Task Force 11, but they're too far away to get there in time. O'Hare attacks from the right rear and quickly shoots down the rearmost Betty. He damages two more as he goes through the formation. Then he goes under the formation and attacks the lead Betty from underneath. Now at this point, O'Hare is also taking friendly anti-aircraft fire from the Lexington, as well as concentrated fire from the group of Betty bombers. Jimmy Thatch sees the action from a distance and describes the stream of fire around O'Hare as a red rain of battle. O'Hare miraculously manages to survive. His concentrated stream of fire into flight leader Ito's lead Betty rips the port engine off its mounts and the engine tumbles into the sea. And they presume that Ito's plane is lost, but it's not. The remaining three Bettys approach the bomb release point and, it, and up till that moment, the Lexington was still you know, flying or uh, cruising straight into the wind and receiving the, the Wildcats that were low on fuel. And, just moments before those Bettys approached the bomb release point, the last Wildcat landed on the deck and Captain Sherman immediately ordered rudder, rudder hard over and the six bombs again narrowly missed the Lexington. So it was all, it was all very, a closely run thing. The Bettys then firewalled their engine and attempted to escape. Two did manage to escape the area. But meanwhile, Ito, the commander who had lost his, his one engine, somehow managed to stabilize his doomed Betty using full power on his starboard side and full opposite rudder. And he attempted another suicide run similar to Nakagawa's earlier version. Ito approached from astern in a terrific hail of anti-aircraft fire. The pilots were probably killed at the control because the Betty veered off and overflew the Lexington and crashed a short distance away. So the USS Lexington was saved primarily through the heroic actions of Butch O'Hare. Two Bettys out of the 17 attackers made it back to base at Rabal. All three Mavis flying boats were lost along with 15 Bettys. That totaled 120 Japanese airmen killed, including a group commander and two division leaders. The Americans lost two Wildcats and one pilot killed in action. The second pilot was fished out of the water after parachuting to safety. Given that the element of surprise was lost, Admiral Brown called off the naval strike against Rabal. Butch O'Hare received the Congressional Medal of Honor for his heroics. And I'm just going to quickly mention a side story. Butch's father was Fast Eddie O'Hare, a business partner and accountant for Al Capone. Fast Eddie decided in the 1930s to cooperate with the feds, and his assistance allowed the feds to jail Capone for income tax evasion. Butch O'Hare was accepted in Annapolis shortly thereafter, leading many to suspect that his appointment was part of his father's deal with the feds. While Butch was training in Pensacola, Capone had his father, Fast Eddie, murdered in a classic gangland execution. Butch's Congressional Medal of Honor forever expunged any stain from the O'Hare family name. Sadly, Butch was killed in action in 1943. But even today, millions of passengers each year pass through Chicago's O'Hare International Airport, named for that son who single-handedly saved an aircraft carrier. The Carmichael Raid. February 22nd, Carmichael's B-17s are ordered back to Townsville. Even though the Task Force 11 had failed to attack Rabal, the B-17s are ordered to proceed alone. Their mission to attack Rabal will be America's first long-range offensive bombing mission. 
There are no ground crews available. The flight crews are forced to service and repair their own ships. Three bombers are already out of service. Dubois B-17 has problems with the number three engine and is scrubbed at the very last minute. The issue turns out to be water in the fuel lines, but Dubose misses the departure. Two planes, one piloted by Frank Bostrom, who later flew MacArthur out of the Del Monte Plantation on March 17th, collided on the taxiway in the darkness shortly before midnight, and they were also scratched. Next slide. This left six B-17s to take off on the first long-range bombing mission mounted by the United States in World War II. It represented virtually the entire strength of the U.S. Army Air Corps in the Pacific Combat Theater. The group soon flew into a vicious tropical front and became separated. Spieth returned to base. The other five planes broke into two groups, one flight led by Major Carmichael and another flight of two led by Captain Lewis, followed by Eaton's crew in the B-17 that would become known forever as the Swamp Ghost. Next slide. Early in the morning of February 23rd, 1942, at 0643, excuse me, 0647 hours, Lewis and Eaton arrived over a ball, but volcanic ash from an active volcano and cloud obscured the targets. The two B-17s circled for 30 minutes, by which time the weather cleared sufficiently to mount a bomb run. Lewis dropped his bombs and he ran for safety. Eaton's bombs did not release and he decided to circle around and make another run and manually release his bombs. This delay allowed the Japanese time to launch their launch six zeros and two Type 96 Nels. The Japanese fighters clawed their way to altitude whereupon they attacked Eaton's B-17. A long running battle ensued. The Swamp Ghost was riddled with bullet holes. One of the Zeros raked 20 millimeter cannon fire in a deflection shot that was only a few feet too high. A line of 20 millimeter fire, if, if the line had been a few feet lower, it would have probably killed most of the crew on board as it left a trail across the rear tail fin. Miraculously, no one on board was injured. Petty Officer Yoshida flew one of the Zeros that attacked Eaton's plane. Yoshida apparently expended all his ammunition, ammunition vainly attempting to bring down the B-17. No longer able to shoot at the B-17, Yoshida continued to follow it after the other Japanese pilots returned to base. As Eaton flew from New Britain over the Solomon Sea towards the main island of New Guinea, he dropped his empty auxiliary fuel tanks and began a long, slow descent towards land. Eaton had calculated fuel burn based on peacetime flying conditions. Given the flight through the tropical front, the long hold over the target, and the strain of a prolonged combat, the B-17 was virtually out of gas by the time Eaton reached the north coast of New Guinea. It was impossible for the B-17 to climb over the towering Owen Stanleys to refuel at Port Moresby. Satisfied at this time that the B-17 was indeed going down, Yoshida finally broke off his pursuit and returned to Rabal, where he claimed the Swamp Ghost as his own kill. He received full credit for downing a flying fortress. Upon reaching the north coast of New Guinea, Eaton saw a verdant field of green grass and performed a textbook wheels up landing. To the crewmen's horror, they soon realized that they were not in a field, they were in a swamp with water up to their waist and in places up to their necks. Eaton's crew managed to radio a report of their plight before crashing into the swamp, but they were not sure if anyone had heard their transmission. It had been heard, but their whereabouts were a mystery. Word was sent to an Australian coast watcher named Alan Champion at Buna to search for a downed American air crew. Alan immediately set off down the coast in a small motor launch. After a brief consultation, the B-17 crewmen agreed to leave the plane and attempt to find their way out of the swamp. To their horror, they soon realized that the stout 12 foot high kunai grass had razor sharp edges and was difficult to navigate. Using machetes and a gun butt, they inched painfully forward through the inhospitable swamp assailed by hordes of malarial mosquitoes, beset by scorpions, avoiding snakes, all the while hearing the telltale sound of nearby splashes as crocodiles entered the water, the men could do little more than grit their teeth and place one weary foot in front of the other. Unable to rest in the water, the men toiled on through a, their first night and the second night. The second day was virtually a repeat of heat, bugs, hunger, and extreme exhaustion. Seeing a clump of trees in a the distance, they struggled to reach it before darkness fell. To their grievous disappointment, the trees stood in a couple feet of water. 
unable to carry on, the men sat in the water with their backs propped against the trees and dozed fitfully through the night. On the third day in the swamp, men began to break down and several suffered hallucinations. Tail Gunner Hall convinced Bombardier Dick Oliver that a mess hall lay some distance behind them and they turned back in search of a hot meal. They were soon rescued by Eaton, but it was clear that the men were approaching the limits of physical and mental endurance. The fourth day led the crew to their first dry ground. It was not a moment too soon and the men felt a surge of, of hope reborn. Shortly thereafter, they encountered a footpath and began following the trail. As they staggered down the path, the men heard chopping sounds ahead. Slowing their pace, they carefully inched forward until they spied a native man chopping up a fallen palm tree. Having heard tales of headhunters and cannibals, the crewmen were apprehensive but had little choice but to move ahead and hope that the natives would be friendly. Upon seeing the ragged band of white strangers emerging from the jungle, the native man immediately fled in terror. After a short time, the man reappeared with a companion and two bare-chested natives warily approached the exhausted white men. Eaton used crude sign language to indicate that they were starving and needed food and assistance. After several minutes of consideration, the natives motioned the men to follow them and they set off to a nearby village named Gumbere. The village consisted of a handful of thatched roof huts built on stilts along a small but swiftly flowing river. The men were fed and ate greedily while the entire village squatted around them and watched in utter fascination. Given a hut to sleep in, the crew collapsed gratefully. At some point in the night, Dick Oliver woke to the surreal scene of firelight flickering and casting shadows through the hut. Each of the sleep sleeping crewmen was surrounded by natives who sat and stared wide-eyed at these exotic white creatures. At first fearful, Oliver soon realized that the natives were simply fascinated by their visitors and did not appear hostile. In the morning, the natives led them to the sea to a little village called Sangara, and in an act of serendipitous good timing, Coast Watcher Alan Champion arrived shortly thereafter in a motor launch and rescued the crew and took them back to Buna, where they were cared for by, helped care for by an Anglican missionary. Champion called uh, Port Moresby and reported that the crew had been located and asked for a, a Catalina flying boat to pick them up and take them back to Moresby. Uh, none, none arrived. So they were in Buna for a week and finally received the message that the Japanese had just invaded the north coast of Papua New Guinea and they were instructed to go inland. The men struggled inland. All of them had malaria at this time and they were in very poor physical condition. Another message came that they would have to walk across the mountains back to Moresby. Champion relayed his thoughts that that was impossible. The crew was too, too sick. And an alternate plan was devised where they met a boat further down in Oro Bay. And that boat took them to Samurai Island where they were dropped off and eventually picked up by a sailing schooner and taken back to Port Moresby. Their odyssey through the swamp and the jungle lasted for five entire weeks. And when they returned to Australia, every one of them had malaria and a variety of other tropical ailments and diseases. And they were given a week in the hospital. And due to the shortage of men and materiel at that point in the war, they were all assigned another airplane and sent back to fighting and flying missions against their foe. So that's the story of the Swamp Ghost, its mission and its crash. And next we're gonna get into the salvage. But you know, what did it mean? What did this mission accomplish? And, and that's a good question. I'm sure someone will ask, so I'll answer it now. Months before the Doolittle Raid on April 18th, 1942, an American task force penetrated into the very heart of the Japanese supposed defense perimeter. Unlike their bouts with previous opponents, the Americans drew blood and they drew it deeply. Yamamoto had predicted that he would run wild for six months in the hope that a defensive perimeter could be established that would discourage the Americans and cause them to sue for peace. Ten weeks after Pearl Harbor, in spite of the, of the Arcadia Conference Protocol, which dictated that uh, England and America defeat Germany first, America was waging war in the heart of Japan's Pacific bastion. These actions may have been largely forgotten by the world, but they were the first dagger through the heart of Imperial Japan. And next slide, please. In 1996, I chartered a small plane and flew a search pattern over the remote Agiembo Swamp in order to locate the Swamp Ghost. I 
had previously flown into a little village called Boga Boga because my great uncle, Bill Ben, had flown a B-17 at one point called the Blackjack. Another crew, months after his death, ditched it off the coast of Boga Boga, and it's in 170 feet of water, and I had been at Boga Boga diving on it, and I chartered a small Baron aircraft with a native pilot. After diving on the, uh, the Blackjack, we flew over the Agamba Swamp on our way back to Port Moresby, and we flew a search grid pattern. And at that time, I actually owned a pressurized Baron at home, so I knew how to fly one, fortunately. And the native pilot that accompanied me to Boga Boga, uh, he had white teeth when we arrived, and, and that's very meaningful in New Guinea, because if any of you have ever been there, most of the people in the uh, jungle villages, you know, they get intoxicated with betel nut. And if you're partaking in betel nut, you've got red teeth. So when we arrived, I, my pilot had white teeth. But after several days at Boga Boga, uh, relaxing with his friends, he began to imbibe. And when we left, his teeth were stained red and black. I don't know if that had any impact on what subsequently happened, but we took off from a, a small field of grass at Boga Boga. And as we took off, he asked me if I minded if he buzzed the village of Boga Boga in a gesture to his new friends. And, and I didn't mind because I had done something even stupider on the flight in, but, but I got away with mine. But he buzzed the village and perhaps because of the betel nut, and I think that's a safe assumption, he was a little under the influence. He actually hit the top of a palm tree with his left engine, which began vibrating badly and rattling. So, uh, but it was still it was still generating enough power to turn the prop, so we weren't you know completely dead. And there was an argument ensued. He wanted to fly straight back, and and I I wanted to search for the swamp ghost because I was leaving the next morning. So we I prevailed, and we flew a search pattern for about an hour and a half, and struggled to find it because the height of the kunai grass folds over the fuselage. And as we finally gave up and began to fly out, I looked back, and for just momentarily, I saw what looked like the shape of a B-17 tail, it's very distinctive. And I never took my eye off the spot, I never saw it again, but I flew back and suddenly and dramatically, the, the B-17 opened up underneath us. And from any angle at all, you couldn't see it because of the height of the grass, unless you were directly overhead. So that's how we found it. And as we flew in a circular pattern, I, I recorded the GPS coordinates so I could come back a few months later in a helicopter. We shot some video of it out the window. And then when we went to depart, we were, had, we were flying very low. We were about 250 feet above the ground, uh, taking the video and, and getting the information. As we went to depart, this gentleman, the pilot, powered up his engines. And at that point, when he powered up, the left engine went all to pieces and began flying apart. And, and he was panic stricken. And I watched him reach under his seat and begin to pull out an emergency procedures manual. Uh, and if any of your pilots, you know that height is your friend, but when you're 250 feet in the air, you've only got seconds to live. So thankfully, I knew how to fly a Baron, and I took command of the plane, feathered the left engine, powered up the right, and we actually made it over the Kokoda Pass on one engine and landed safely at Port Moresby. So that was the, the adventurous manner in which I located the Swamp Coast. It wasn't a missing airplane. I just couldn't find anybody that would tell me where it was. So I had to go find it for myself. Several months later, I returned in a helicopter and explored the B-17 at length. It had a presence and a majesty that was undeniable. By the time I left the site, I was determined that I would come back and salvage this magnificent warplane and preserve it for future generations. As, well, as you can well imagine, the logistical challenges of salvaging this aircraft from one of the most remote places on Earth were staggering. But I can attest to the fact that those engineering challenges paled next to the political challenges that delayed the project year after year. If this were a week-long event, I would take the time to comprehensively detail those struggles, but for the sake of brevity, I will merely mention it as a nightmarish and agonizing process. I was joined early on in this uh, effort to salvage the Swamp Ghost by my good friend, David Talashay, who owned the movie B-17 that was used in the movie Memphis Bell. And he allowed me to fly that to air shows with him. We, he was like almost like a second father. So he initially joined me on this salvage uh, until uh, at some point, it, it, due to the political issues, he was forced to withdraw, but he, he still remained in the background supporting the process. 
Unfortunately, he died uh, several years before we got it out. I finally received an export permit in 2005. I assembled a salvage team and sent the salvage equipment to PNG via sea freight. I arrived in April and in, we began the salvage late that month and we, and we worked through the month of May. Problems immediately proliferated. Although I'd planned to lift the B-17 out of the swamp in pieces using a Russian heavy lift helicopter known as a Mil-8, I needed a small chopper for support operations while we disassembled the plane. The helicopter that I chartered crashed several days prior to my arrival and killed everyone on board. I made frenzied attempts to charter a different small helicopter, but none were available in country at that time. Meanwhile, I was still attempting to move this process forward because we had assembled all the equipment, we had the salvage team there. So we barged all the equipment around to the old PT boat at Tufi, which is now a dive resort. And from there, we, we took a fishing trawler up to the mouth of the Musa River, hauling several banana boats. And then we ferried our equipment up the river in banana boats. So we finally assembled at Quifade Village, which is just a couple miles from the wreck site, but we could get no further. I actually went to the, to the plane on foot, but you, it was impossible to take the salvage gear on foot to the aircraft. So we got to Quifade and we were stuck. Fortunately, one of the members of the camera crew had a uh, satellite phone and he was also filming Survivor, the Survivor series. And the phone was uh, courtesy of Survivor. And, and we used that and I called a good friend in Australia named Steve Spinoz. And Steve agreed to drop everything he was doing and fly a squirrel, which is a small uh, helicopter capable of minor heavy lift activity. And he, he put pontoons on that helicopter, flew across the Coral Sea, over the Owen Stanleys, and finally rendezvoused at our village. So after weeks of effort, the team and the equipment were finally assembled at Quifade. And although I'd, I'd, I'd failed to get the helicopter, we finally got this helicopter from Australia and we were back in business. So we spent the next week inflating airbags under the B-17 in an attempt to lift it out of the water. One of the complexities of this particular salvage was that it was neither on dry ground nor underwater. It was, on, it was a little bit of each. So we had to get it out of the water to work on it. But we were also, we had, you know, we had, if it was all in water, you would float it, you could tow it. And there were a variety of things uh, unique to each of those operations. And, and we didn't, we had the disadvantage disadvantages uh, of, of both and and we lack some of the advantages of both so the the swamp ghost uh, and we had a number of other problems initially we couldn't keep the bags under the wings they kept walking out you know if, if it was on hard land you would lift it up and it would lift straight up what we realized is because it was both water with hard land under it as, as you lifted it up, the bags tended to, to creep and float and they kept popping out of the wings. So the solution finally was to uh, fill the bags partially with the water to weigh them down. We did get it out of the water. We did cut off the engines. We did separate the wings. Uh, and I know someone in the question phase will ask why, you know, we've been accused of being a little brutal in terms of how we took the plane apart. Uh, all I can tell you is there were aircraft mechanics there like Billy Smith, a Qantas aircraft mechanic. There were some very qualified individuals and we were working hard in the most adverse conditions possible with on metal that burned your skin to touch, uh, surrounded by tropical malarial mosquitoes, several of us were bit by scorpions, and we couldn't get the plane completely out of the water. And at the end of the day, we just ran out of options and we, we were not working in an aircraft shop and we did things that had to be done in order to bring this ship home. And that's what we did. Next slide, please. And when we were ready to lift it, we had to rendezvous with an ocean going barge. So we had a barge rendezvous and a Russian heavy lift came in to actually lift the components. Now, one of the, the fears was that there was a certain amount of water that was still in the fuselage and we were, afraid that we were going to be beyond the performance envelope of the mill eight. And indeed we were slightly beyond, but we were at sea level and they did succeed in lifting the fuselage. 
Uh, we had trouble with the first wing because the fuel bladders had filled up with water and we did not account for all that weight. And uh, we did drop a wing, but Boeing made such an incredible airfoil that it immediately flattened out and spiraled to the ground and landed itself with minimal damage. In fact, you could hardly tell the difference between um, one wing and the other. Next slide, please. And that is the fuselage of the Swamp Ghost, uh, rising above the swamp for the first time in over half a century and flying again. It was a majestic and magnificent sight. And uh, as I say in the documentary, it was, it was one of those special moments in life that you, you, you've worked so hard to attain and the moment comes and you just want to live it in that moment, uh, knowing that, that it's going to be impossible to reproduce. The, after we got it out, uh, could we get the next slide, Monica? And one more. So we got it on a barge and we took it to lay. And there was, one of the ironies of this is that there are always people that are jealous of, of, of your accomplishment when you do something unique. Uh, there were entities like Smithsonian and Travis that had tried to get this plane. It was regarded as the holy grail of military aviation because of its intact nature and its, its historic importance. And they did not succeed. And there, there was a group that showed up in Port Moresby while I was salvaging it. And they told the local news media that I was stripping New Guinea of its cultural assets and that I was pillaging it of these assets and that this plane was worth $65 million as they reported to the news station, which is absolutely absurd. And they went on to make the statement that Travis and Smithsonian had attempted to salvage it and failed, but a contractor from Philadelphia tried and, and succeeded. And you know, how is that possible? So the inference was, well, there must've been corruption. So my expert permit was revoked and the, an investigation was begun, which took four years and considerable legal fees and they tried by any way possible to determine if there had been any corruption, but we had, in my case, we had honored our agreement to the letter. Uh, we had paid out the, the sums they asked for to the government, and eventually they did allow us to ship it. The tragedy was that Dave Talashay died in that period, and he dearly wanted to see this plane return. And the, all of the surviving crewmen who were still alive when I began this effort all died. The last crewman died within two weeks of it shipping out of New Guinea. So all the crewmen uh, were denied the ability to see this aircraft one more time. When we brought it back you know, to Long Beach, we had a, a, a service there. And, and eventually, Dave Talashay's son, John, contacted the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. And a deal was made to bring it to Pearl Harbor, where it is on display to this day. Next slide, please. So I filmed a documentary about the, the Swamp Ghost, which showed on History Channel on July 4th, and a, a longer version shows on PBS on Veterans Day, November 11th. And for that, we filmed some reenactments. And for the reenactments, I borrowed the movie Memphis Bell off the Talashe estate, and we painted it with pigmented wax to look exactly like the Swamp Ghost. So this is the movie Me Memphis Bell, which I have dolled up here as the Swamp Ghost, and I prevailed upon Kermit Weeks at Fantasy of Flight in Kissimmee to allow us to fly out of uh, Fantasy of Flight, and we filmed the reenactments over the Everglades. Next slide. And here is the Swamp Ghost, essentially as it appears today, and you notice in front of it, there is a, a Disney uh, drawing of the Swamp Ghost, and much to my astonishment, on the 75th anniversary of Pearl Harbor, a, a, a group of gentlemen from Disney showed up for the 75th anniversary celebration. And one of them, Michael Gabriel, had painted this. And Michael Gabriel's a legend at Disney. He, if, if any of your kids have seen Pocahontas, he's credited with animating it, writing it, directing it. So he's a superstar at Disney, and he's become a wonderful friend as well. And his father was a pilot and military pilot, and several of the other key people at Disney Animation um, that had fathers that also served in the Second World War that were pilots, and one of them, in fact, was shot down over New Britain, which is the same island where Ball's on. So there was this extraordinary uh, chemistry that we developed, and they originally wanted to paint that nose art on, on the Swamp Ghost, but I refused because it never had nose art, and I did not think it was historically appropriate. 
And they eventually hit upon the creative solution. And again, we're talking Disney, they are creative geniuses. So they hit upon the solution of doing a Disney attraction around the airplane, which uh, would use state-of-the-art techniques to show the plane being built in Seattle, flying its mission, being attacked, crashing in the swamp, and all, all these images projected on the wreckage of the plane as I found it. And at the end of it, they wanted to project the image of the swamp ghost nose art. And as the lights come up, the image fades away. It's a brilliant plan. And we're still trying to raise the funding to accomplish that. I have, I'm fully confident that that will happen and fully confident that once it's realized, uh, this airplane, the Swamp Ghost, uh, surrounded by a Disney-designed attraction exhibit, will instantly become the world's foremost and most impressive aviation exhibit on Earth. So that is my presentation. And one more slide, please. I, I cannot end this without uh, saying thank you to David Talashay and noting him in my memory, in memory. And he was a wonderful man. He, he began the Warbird collection movement. He bought a P-51 Mustang shortly after the war. He was a B-17 pilot himself, flying in the bloody 100th out of Europe. So uh, in memory of David Talashay, and that concludes my remarks. And I'm sorry I went over. Well, thank you so much, uh, Alfred, about the detailed analysis of the air battles surrounding the attack on Pearl Harbor and how it led the um, eventual the B-17 uh, story from Pearl Harbor all the way to the swamps in Papua New Guinea. So you did have quite a, a lot of details about that story and as well as your connection with your family. So we do have some questions from our, our viewers here today. Um, despite the detailed account, we do have some questions. And one from Kelsey is, um, when you were flying over the Papua New Guinea um, and you saw the swamp ghost, um, you, you indicated that it wasn't the first time that was uh, sighted. So do you know when the first sighting of swamp ghost was after it was lost? Uh, yes, I do. Unfortunately, at my age, it's hard to remember exact dates, but the, it was essentially around 1970, give or take. Uh, and there were some gentlemen in, that were affiliated with the Australian Armed Forces that flew over in the helicopter and landed on the wings. Now, when they landed the Swamp Coast in the Agamba Swamp, there were no trees in that area. So the geography has changed considerably because they landed it in, the, in this huge ocean of grass. And in 1970, that was still largely the case. And, and I have seen pictures of those early visits. And through the years, a number of other people came in and visited the plane. And most of them, unfortunately, you know, took souvenirs home. And there were, you know, part of the, controversy surrounding the salvage was driven by people that believed it should remain in the swamp and not be taken out and displayed at a museum. Uh, I obviously disagreed with that. And one of the, I, I think the clinching argument towards that is that everyone that went to it, and there weren't very many, I mean, there, it's a very difficult place to get to, but of the few people that went, they, they took all the instruments, they, they took, and everyone wanted a piece. So it, the you know, and, and other sites along the North Coast have been basically scrapped for the value of the metal by natives. The only reason this was so intact is it was so incredibly difficult to get to. But it, it, the question is, would it be salvaged in a million tiny pieces or would it be salvaged in its entirety and preserved for posterity? And that obviously is my position. Thank you, Alfred. I had a question from Richard about one of the air battles. Uh, so the question is, is there any truth to the story that during the air battle, the life raft inflated and flew into the left horizontal stabilizer and was deflated by the left waist gunner, gouging the top of the left stabilizer? That, that's a true story. As far as I know, yes, the, the crew, the surviving crew members actually told me that story in person. All right, thank you for that confirmation. I'm sure that was uh, what we needed for that. Now, the uh, next question is about um, the restoration of the Swamp Ghost. So you mentioned a little bit about what, uh, what Disney was doing, um, but are there still uh, um, efforts to recover this, to restore this aircraft and? No, I, I, my original hope and intention when I got involved was to restore this, make it airworthy, and fly it. 
uh, several things happened. One of them was 2008, which uh, changed the outlook for a number of people, myself included. So, and it also became clear that it would be prohibitively expensive. We figured it would, but at the time we budgeted maybe $7 million to make it airworthy. And it would be prohibitively expensive. And in addition, you would have to absolutely destroy the airplane in order to make it airworthy. You would have to take all the historic elements apart and replace them with, was, use them as molds and replace them. So you would wind up with a model airplane built with a few pieces of metal from the original. And that, that would be an unfortunate uh, desecration of an iconic historic artifact. So when it went to Pearl Harbor, interestingly, initially, uh, members of your uh, staff there on, did want to paint it green and make it look like new, and, and I, I refused to allow that to happen. And to me, part of the mystique of this airplane was the ability to see it the way I saw it when I first flew over it in New Guinea. It had a kind of a magic about it. And that's true. And they, they, and I, you've all come to realize that as well. And I've been told that by members of the museum that people walk in and they walk past a lot of the shiny, you know, new, new airplanes and they walk back to see the wreckage of the swamp because, because it's evocative. I mean, it's a very, very evocative image. Thank you, Alfred. I, about um, the recovery of the aircraft, I know that Swamp Ghost wasn't the only one that uh, you had identified and helped recover. There were five more, I believe. Um, Brian is asking if you are still recovering aircraft and how does one get involved with and assisting in, in doing this, recovering aircraft? Well, the, let me just clarify something. The, the, the planes I found with the remains of airmen those are not salvageable. Normally, if, if everyone's dead, the plane is in pieces all over the side of a mountain. Uh, if the crew survived, then there's usually an airplane to be salvaged. So, yes, I, I, with, I, you know, I don't want to enlarge on it, but yes, I am interested in, in a few other sites. I'm not sure when or if they'll happen as far as how to get involved. I mean, I do have a website, Aero Archaeology, and, and there is a, a means to contact me and stay in touch. Thank you for but that. I, I don't have, I, I can't enlarge upon that. Mm, all right, thank you. And now Brad is asking about the documentary and I know a lot of people were asking about it and um, commenting on it in the chat, but just to make sure everybody gets the information, can you talk about the um, documentary that you have for the Swamp Ghost? What do you want to know? I guess, uh, where can we find it? And I know that you have one that's on the History Channel and then one that's coming out in November. So tell us the difference between the two and how people can access those two. Yeah, the difference between the two is that the History Channel, uh, if for their one hour show, they have 19 minutes of commercials. So you give them a 41 minute episode. So they have that and it's a very good episode and, and it moves very quickly. I mean, one of the, there are pros and cons. One of the, the pros is that it, it's, it moves really fast. And that was shown uh, early in July, and it is streaming on the History Channel. Uh, I, off the top of my head, I can't give you the, you know, the, the direction, but I'm sure you can look it up easily. So it is available through a streaming service, and I believe it's still up. Now, at some point this fall, it will be taken down, and we have just finished a, a full one-hour show, uh, which will go on American Public Television, or PBS, and that should be shown in, um, I think it's over 90% of the PBS markets. There are a couple that didn't pick it up, but it, it's, it's, almost, it's almost going to be universally shown in the United States. And that is uh, November 11th, Veterans Day. Or it's also the day my mother was born, but she was born, it was still Armistice Day. All right, great. So people have another way they can access some more information about Swamp Ghost. So um, I had one final question for you is that uh, I know you commented on Pearl Harbor being, you felt that Pearl Harbor was a cemetery for your Uncle Fred Ben. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more why you feel that way? Well, because his remains were never found. So whatever remains uh, he has were committed to the bottom of Pearl Harbor. So in, in my mind, Pearl Harbor is his gravesite. Uh, that makes it, and it's a cemetery. It's a living, it's a cemetery, and not only for Fred, but obviously for all the men in the Arizona, uh, any men that were, were, were left behind. And, and it's, it's a, still a cemetery today. There are survivors of the Arizona that still have their remains interred in the Arizona. It's definitely a cemetery. It is Fred's final resting place and, until we get evidence otherwise. 
So, uh, and in my mind, the memorial to the Swamp Ghost, when, when and if the Disney attraction happens, I'm hoping to have a memorial like an, uh, in the entrance telling a story. And part of that story is a tribute to my own family. And that's, that's the most beautiful memorial that I could imagine to their service and to the service of other men like them. Yes, and I guess I feel that way about our program today is that by sharing your story, we can share a story of remembrance and, and honoring those people that served their country to fight for our freedom. And on this day of September 11th, when we are trying to honor and remember um, people that perished in that um, fateful day and, and also in all of the battles and fights that exist in Operation Enduring Freedom. Um, so I feel like it's quite an honor for us to be sharing your story and the story of the Swamp Ghost on this, this special day. So, Well, there, there is a definite connection. I mean, at Pearl Harbor, we were attacked by surprise. Thousands of people were killed. That's exactly what happened on 9-11. So it is an appropriate day. And thank you so much for having me on this webinar. Thank you, too. So and we are finished with our questions now. So um, just want to thank you for taking the time to uh, let us know a little bit about um, your family, the stories of the Swamp Ghost. And also um, want to thank Ashley, um, our educator. She's prepared a lot of great resources. So if you're interested in finding out more about this or or even some things for your younger children to use that she's got some coloring pages and some other activities that they can do associated to so that they can learn more about the Swamp Ghost. Our mission at the museum is to hope to inspire in fu the future generations and ma make sure that the memory and stories of World War II um, last uh, throughout generations to follow. So we wanted to say thank you to everyone that came to uh, watch this program. Um, so on behalf on the, of the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum, thank you, Alfred, and also thanks to our viewers. If you, um, if you have enjoyed this education program, please consider um, possibly donating to the museum. And if you, are, um, if you think that that's something you wanna do, please just visit the website to find out more. So thank you all and see you next time. Thank you very much.